My name is Adrian Kerr. I'm the manager of the Museum of Free Dairy, which was a project set up by the Bloody Sunday Trust to tell the story of the events that happened in this area in the sort of late 1960s, early 1970s. Events which are world famous on their own, the, the civil rights movement, the descent into conflict, the massacre on Bloody Sunday. But these are events which have always been told from the British point of view, from the other point of view. We needed something to balance that, to tell the story from the side of the people here, the people who actually lived through it, the people who were most affected by it. It's, it's a community story told from the perspective, very much and very subjectively from the perspective of that community. But it's this community that suffered most in the year that we're talking about. So it is only right that their story, their memory, be given a proper presentation and that's what the museum was set up for. It's vitally important that the museum is where it is. We're right on the spot where the events of Bloody Sunday happened. The Battle of the Bogside was right outside the door. So many of the key events happened around here. When you have the opportunity to tell a story in exactly the right place, it should be taken. It makes a story so much more powerful when people realise that they're standing exactly where it happened. And as well as the building, we have the staff who were directly involved. John, whose brother was killed and who was there himself. Jean, whose brother was also killed. So even on the management, on the board of management, it's all people who were directly involved. So it, it's all of this adds to the very first hand and personal account that the museum sets out to present and that people who come to the museum want to see. They want to see that first hand account, they don't want an academic version of this, the, w the personal account is so much better and because we have the opportunity to do that through the site, through the people, through the artefacts then that is the way we have to tell the story. The role of this museum is to present this community story. Like I said before, it's it's an internationally known story. It's been written about for decades. People's image of this community is based on that story. And it's only fair that this community has the opportunity to, to give their version of those events. I mean, that is how they're being judged. When people hear the name Bogside around the world, they're thinking of the late 60s, the early 70s, when the Bogside was the centre of world news. It was a violent time. People need to know the truth of that where the violence came from. You know, th this community has been labelled because of those years and it's only fair that they have the opportunity to answer that and show why all of this happened from their own perspective. A lot of the people around here, a lot of the older ones, lived through these events. You know, they're still part of our lives, they're not history. They're still affecting us every day and people want, thankfully now people want to learn about it. People are travelling from all over the world to learn first hand what happened here, the proper account of what happened here, not the media account that they've been given for years which was very very biased towards the British side. And people here I think are glad that there is an opportunity now for people from all over the world to learn the truth about what happened here. Not what we were told over the years but what the actual truth was. Remembering and commemorating and resolving the past is a vital step towards healing it. Because you know, in the North we have a very, very diverse range of perceptions of history. We're never going to agree on all these different perceptions. One man's terrorist, another man's freedom fighter, the usual cliche. I don't think the point is that we have to agree. What we have to do is reach a point where we can discuss the differences in history and understand and acknowledge the other person's point of view. Before we can do that we need to present all those different points of view. You know, and people need to be able to present it in their own way. They need to have the freedom to be honest about what they're saying, whether that offends others or not. And we need to reach a point where we can go and look at all these different perspectives of history. Not necessarily agree with them all. Well, we definitely won't agree with them all. But we need to be open to understand and acknowledging what others experienced. So we can discuss it, argue about it, whatever, but it becomes something we all accept rather than something that we fight about. We have always had a good relationship with the unionist community. I mean, we work with the Apprentice Boys Museum, 
which would be a manifestation of a unionist orientated history though not of the recent conflict we have had numerous groups from within the unionist community visiting the museum and like i said we don't expect them to come here and agree with everything we're saying in the museum we just hope that they will come here and understand it and that's the experience we've had so far that when unionists come to the museum they realize it's a museum about human rights about civil rights it's not a political museum and that's where we get some really interesting discussions from people who we're not preaching to the converted then we're talking to people who we need to understand recently and this is where i get on to one of my favorite rants the so-called national museum in the north opened a gallery on the recent conflict and because it's government sponsored government run has to satisfy everyone has to offend no one has ended up being totally bland and asinine and is a complete waste of space in my opinion it gives a version of the conflict that is it's just cold facts and figures there's no human feeling in it and i don't think there's any point in doing this unless you allow that human feeling to come through this is a story about people all of the stories that need to be told about the north about the conflict here are stories about people and the recent stories they can't be told in a cold academic way they're not facts and figures the reality is for centuries the walls were what kept catholics out and protected protestants that's gone centuries ago but to a certain degree the walls are still seen as a symbol of that the way that they look down on the bog side the way it's they're like a symbol of the old unionist order looking down on nationalists now this is symbolism based on history of centuries ago in reality now the walls are a tourist attraction you know everybody goes up on the walls everybody walks around them you know they belong to the whole city but there is still some vestige of that old history attached to them which is the exclusion the walls were built to keep Catholics out. That our regional government can't come up with a policy on how to remember the past. Because they've all got such different viewpoints of it. They can't even agree who a victim of the conflict is. I mean, from a Republican point of view, everyone who died during a conflict is a victim. And equal. Unionists won't accept that, for instance, a member of the IRA who died on active service can be seen as a victim. They say he's a criminal then we've got the role of britain and all of this who are still in denial that they were a part of the conflict they still argue the point that they were a peacekeeping force here between two warring tribes which is complete rubbish so and then we have individuals and organizations who are obstructing any sort of proper discussion of the past because they wish to hide or minimize their own role in it so this is a debate that's been going on for years and there's years left in it not only of how we deal with the past in terms of dealing with unsolved crimes or whatever from the conflict but how we deal with it in terms of telling the history and all, none of that is being resolved at the moment there's just no agreement between the governing parties in the north as to how we can do it and there's no prospect of any agreement you know, the two sides are so far apart on it my own opinion is that museums like this are, as I've said earlier, it doesn't have to be museums, it can be other sorts of projects, sort of ground level, community based initiatives for remembrance and memory are what we need. Not something coming from a government who have an axe to grind and who will have a bias one way or another, but let the communities do it themselves where we know what the bias is we know a loyalist community is going to tell a loyalist story we know a republican community is going to tell a republican story that's the way it should be but that's honest you know if we at least it's honest remembrance what we're planning on and hoping to start within hopefully the next six seven months is an extension to the museum what we have at the moment is we've got the central exhibition and it works but we do so much work with school groups we need a space for that we have a fantastic documentary archive which is great for research purposes but i'm the only person that's got a key to that archive no one else can study it except me at the moment and we we just need a space for temporary exhibitions for conferences stuff like that and that's that's what the plan is hopefully we'll start that 
sometime early next year and that'll mean we can do all the work about remembrance and education around the story on this site on their own history we could actually host displays like that and bring not only histories that we agree with but even histories that we also disagree with we can bring them into the museum and have them on display here and let this community come and see what other we, I mean we want people to come to this museum to see what this community has experienced but it's also important that this community can see what other communities have experienced so if we could bring in exhibitions from loyalist unionist areas in here so people from around here could come and see them that would be they're all small steps along the route to resolution but they're vital steps there are generations who have already been damaged by the conflict but there are generations to come who haven't and we don't want to have to leave it to them to resolve what we went through if we can resolve it now then our children grandchildren don't have to so it doesn't drag on into other generations you know since the beginning of the peace process and the ceasefires in 94 the role of the european union here has largely been to try and buy peace in the north we are coming up to our fourth round of peace funding and that has been over the past 20 odd years has largely gone to projects working towards reconciliation shared future cross community projects stuff like that so for us in our own parochial little conflict europe has been a source of funding to try and help us resolve these issues and that's really it we're so absorbed in our own conflict here and we're looking at our own memories our own memorialization there's very little thought of what's going on outside even i mean a lot of the loyal order marches during the summer are actually commemorations of like the battle of the psalm and stuff like that so on one level they're linked to wider european remembrance but there is much a part of unionists here celebrating how loyal they were to britain and therefore how disloyal the nationalists were so again even while they're looking at a wider european conflict they're very self-centered on the north people here and i'm sure it's probably the same in other conflict situations we're so focused on our own that we're not looking at what's going on outside I mean, it's only when i've started becoming involved in this project that i found out that there is a a european day of remembrance for victims of terrorism now here where the word terrorist is thrown about all over the place mainly at republicans by unionists you would think there'd be some capital made out of a european wide day to remember victims of terrorism i only found out it existed a couple of weeks ago i mean i've been working on memory and reconciliation issues for most of my adult life unionists constantly use the word terrorist here aimed at republicans i mean speaking as me not as the manager of the museum i, I am an irish republican i don't see irish republican paramilitaries as terrorists there are some that are, are in clear breach of the geneva convention especially state killings a number of cases have gone to the european court and th these are cases where the british army or police have been involved in the killing and the court has ruled against britain and britain has just ignored the ruling of the european court sure. now it has been ruled that investigations carried out in the past were not article 2 compliant because the investigators in state killings are too close to those that they are investigating britain's response to that is or was okay i will not do it again but it doesn't look back into what when they've done it in the past they argue that only investigations undertaken since that ruling have to be article 2 compliant and that ruling was only about 10 years ago so all of the killings during the conflict involved in the british army are the police they say well they happen before that ruling so they're not covered by it so britain has had a fairly long history of completely ignoring the european court of human rights when it comes to the north they completely ignore Amnesty International reports on their own human rights abuses here. They, you know, any criticism of Britain for its role in the conflict here, Britain ignores. While condemning other countries for doing the same sort of thing. It's got the benefit of how we can tell the story and how we can be part of trying to resolve it when you're dealing with such 
a recent history. We, we're close enough to it, or we're still at that point where resolution is needed. So I believe that proper storytelling, proper memory, can be a major help towards the the resolution of the conflict. But like I said, it's, you balance that with the fact that when you're dealing with something so recent, you have to be so careful. There have been an awful lot of conflicts in Europe, especially since the Second World War, that to my understanding are just completely ignored in European policy, and they shouldn't be. There are, it, these conflicts all affect each other. It, the vast majority of people killed in the conflict in the north of Ireland died in the north of Ireland. But quite a few died on mainland Europe. There was a lot killed in Britain. You know, this spread beyond our borders. Other conflicts have spread beyond borders as well. But even when the conflict itself doesn't, the impact can through emigration and stuff like that. So, I don't think any of the conflicts are completely isolated, the one geographical area. So they shouldn't just be looked at as part of that single geographic area. And I think uh, there's always lessons to be learned and, you know, pointers to be taken from how other people have got through a conflict of how they've resolved the conflict. So greater communication between different areas that have had a conflict is has to be a good thing. You know, if even if it's only s tips on how to bring certain people into dialogue or anything like that, it can be fairly small or it can be right up to the issues about how to set up a government in a post-conflict situation. But you learn that by going to look at other situations, so any sort of communication between different areas any sort of joint commemorations, any sort of joint remembrance, I think has to be a good thing. Now whether it would work, as I've already explained, in the North we're very so focused on our own conflict that most people don't even know about the European Days of Remembrance. But one of the, the things that we have here is if you want to organise an act of remembrance, somebody has to organise it. Depending on who organises it here, the other side is go are going to be alienated by it. You know, if Republicans tried to organise a commemoration for everyone killed in the conflict in the North, Unionists would condemn it, and vice versa. But if the European Union were organising something you know, that was coming from outside of here, there might be more chance of wider involvement. Because the way we are here, nobody will take part in something organised by the other side. There are ways of bringing information and learning about different conflicts around with a wee bit of imagination. So while I'm not sure about any immediate benefit of European wide remembrance, I think there would eventually be a benefit from it. So it's something that I would certainly support. I'm not sure how. It's something I think should happen, but I can't describe exactly how I think it should happen. It's still very, very vague, but there could, there could definitely be a benefit in in a wider European remembrance policy to take in all the, the conflicts. And there's also an insult in the fact that there isn't. 